This is F Society IRC Podcast, a Mr. Robot show. I'm your moderator of this chat, Hiroja Shai. Please note that this podcast will have spoilers. In this chat, we will discuss the underlying themes, historical influences, inspirations, technology, ethical dilemmas, and other inspirational insights we have gleaned from each episode of the first season of Mr. Robot. We will be bringing on experts to share their insights and knowledge with us in each chat. We will also be reviewing each episode of the first season, as well as the second season when it premieres. We are awake, we are free, we are alive for F Society IRC Podcast. So this is the second part of the season premiere of Mr. Robot, i um, Ask Part 2. I'm going to kind of break this up into kind of five key parts. Uh, I'm going to break it up to the four main characters of this episode, which are Phil Price, Angela, Elliot, and Gideon. And then you have the minor characters of Dominique DePal and uh, Joanne Wellick. So we're going to first off, we're going to start off that the episode does open up with uh, Scott Knowles burning the, the money, which we talked about last episode because it's more part of the Darlene storyline. But it opens up basically what Elliot has been discussing and talking about with us as his friends, which is the 1% of the 1% that controls the wealth being, you know, completely evil. And we see a demonstration of this from the fact that in a room in an undisclosed loca- location in Washington, D.C., Phil Price is sitting across from the Fed, and it's three Fed chairmen and Phil Price. So these four people are about to decide the, basically the global out- economic outcome of everybody. And the Fed reveals to, you know, reveals to the audience that they've already pumped $900 billion in the last 30 days to Evil Corp. And Evil Corp has burnt through the money, and they don't understand that. And Phil Price is saying that they have to build their database. There's no if and if that's about it. The only way to get out of the current in their mess that they're, that they're in right now is to build that database, and that's going to take time. It's going to take months. I'm thinking it's probably going to take years, but it's going to take time. But Phillips is making suggestions to them because they're basically whining to him, telling them that if they need to get more money, they need to go sell the T-bills to the Chinese and use that to get the cash into the economy. Uh, but they're saying, you know, hey, the big three are on the verge of collapse. People are hoarding cash. The housing market is halted. And the president can't go back to Congress for a bailout. And they want him to resign. They don't have the votes to continue on forward with any type of bailout situation with him as maybe the head of E-Corp. They just don't have it. And Philip Price is having none of this. He basically says he's not going to resign. And then he tells the story about the Fed holiday that the FBR had done. And basically what had happened, and this is a true story, was that during the, the Great Depression, FDR had closed all the banks and then slowly opened them up um, through phases. And the reason why he was able to do so was that the Feds basically cooked the books to establish that all these banks after, the, after these, the, the, this bank holiday were solvent when in fact they were, they were not. Um, they were just lies. And the lie was told to bring confidence in the economy, a confidence in the government, confidence in that everything is under control. And that if Philip Price were to resign, um, basically at the end of telling this story and going on to the, about the whole concept of confidence and how, you know, we're conning people to believe in something, that the, they buy and sell what we want them to sell. And if they don't have the confidence um, in the government or in the economy, then basically the con is over. And that he's not going to resign in essence as well. So he tells them to basically get their shit together and to get his votes. So that the evil corp can continue on with what they need to do to rebuild those databases. And that's pretty much the end of his story aligned for this particular episode. Um, I find the Philip Price character very fascinating in general because while I don't think it's a blase attitude, I feel that he has this over-exuberant sense of confidence. I'm not sure because he has an idea or a hidden agenda going on because he 
feels or seems to think that everything is going to be solved. Everything has a solution and it's going to be solved and everything's going to be okay. I don't know if this is something that he's capable of projecting towards people and it's a false sense of confidence or he actually has, you know, some type of hidden knowledge because we do know that he knows White Rose, or at least the White Rose is civilian counterpart. And he has stated to the end of last season that they, that they know, Evil Corp knows who was responsible for the hack. Now, I'm not sure if that person is Tywell Wellick or actually Elliot in F Society. Um, it hasn't yet been revealed to us. But he has a certain sense of confidence, if you will, and I'm not really sure how I feel about it in general. So that was the end of his storyline. Uh, he does have some influence with, a, or I should say, another character has an influence on him uh, later on the episode. Uh, we'll get into that uh, when we talk about that character. But we're going to talk about the two minor characters that are in this episode. In particular, we're going to talk about Dominique Papelli, the FBI agent, and Joanne Wallach. So Dominique Papelli apparently is the uh, FBI agent in charge of figuring out the F9 hack and tracking down members of F Society. Uh, she's in some bodega and she's ordering a sandwich and she has a familiar familiarity with the shopper keep. He's an Iranian and they're chit-chatting about his family. His wife is not there because their daughter is sick. And on his, son, on his cash register it says, uh, small bills only. And they're just having a friendly conversation. And there's a bit of a line, and somebody, you know, yells, you know, hurry it up. It was kind of a bit rude, and Dominic Pelles, like, turns back around, and she looks at the shopper keep, and, you know, you know, that's rude. And then she says, Fars in Farsi, you know, a dickhead. And then she grabs a sweet in her sandwich, pays for it, and kind of goes away. Um, when she does grab her sweet, though, we do see... Uh, Joanne Willock on all the gossip magazines, if you will, just basically commenting, commenting on her wealth, considering that her husband is somewhere out on the run. And when we need next see Dominic, um, she is, you know, sucking on her candy and she's at her FBI office and she meets with another FBI agent and they go into a room and there, there is Gideon. And Gideon is sitting there, and we don't know what type of conversation um, they're gonna, they had or we're going to have. We don't know if this is part of the series of conversations that Gideon spoke about last episode with Elliot about the FBI kind of blaming him for the F Society hack, or he's there to basically tell them about Elliot. So that's the end of her storyline. Just a little introduction of the character. Uh, I personally think it gives a kind of a hint of a kind of... Uh, she kind of seems kind of a bit whimsical, a little eccentric, if you will, but that she is very competent, that, she, that the F Society is not going to be tracked down by a bunch of bumbling idiots. This person is very competent. She has a language skill. She has a presence about her. So it'll be interesting to see more revelations about her as a character. Now let's get into Joanne Wellick. So Joanne Wellick, uh, she's in an undisclosed location. She's in some kind of ritzy hotel with a, a, lo a lover slash boyfriend. And she's, you know, going through her, I guess you can say her bondage routine. Um, which is, you know, interesting if you will. Uh, it goes on a little bit more, uh, you know, she's still in the same hotel room, they're done, her lover slash boyfriend is watching television, and basically in the background throughout pretty much the entire season premiere, you see television sets just basically on news channels, uh, talking about the F9 hack, talking about Tyler, Tywell, Wellick, and... It's Nancy Grace talking about him, how he hasn't been found, how there's all these clues tracing him to the hack, that he's responsible for the death of uh, Scott Mills' wife. Why hasn't anybody found him? Just seeing you know, Nancy Grace. Uh, the boyfriend changes the channel, and it changes to something called uh, Vander Pump, which I find it very interesting. It was like some kind of reality program, a kind of in-universe reality program I've never seen before where... It's kind of like The Bachelor or The Bachelorette, if you will, 
one of those type of reality programs. Uh, but Joanne Wellick's not interested in watching. The bodyguard that we have seen before with Tyler Wellick, who's responsible for picking up Elliot uh, during the season premiere of the first season, last year comes into the room to take Joanne Wellick home. The boyfriend leaves. Um, he has to leave before her because she can't be seen with him. And it's kind of obvious because of the fact that, you know, she is being, I guess you can say, watched by probably like the FBI and everybody, but also by the paparazzi. Uh, she goes home. She's walking her son in a stroller. And as she's going home, you see a little black box. And this little black box, if you will, is very nice. It has a bow on it. Uh, she takes it into her home. She you know, puts her kid away, if you will, and she starts opening up the box, and it has a box within a box within a box, and there's a music box, so as she's opening it up, it was very interesting, she's being very careful with it, not just because it's a very nice, expensive item, because she is slowly kind of taking her hands and sliding her hands around the boxes, looking for any hidden devices. Eventually she gets to the music box and she flips it over and she sees a cell phone. So already there's some type of protocol that she knows that she's supposed to adhere to when, when she find a box, finds a box like that. And it could be something that was already pre-planned between her and Tywell Wellick or her and somebody else. But she has a, a phone. It looks like a very early version of a Samsung phone in it, or some type of Android phone, if you will. And she's basically waiting for a phone call. Uh, later on in the episode, at night, uh, she does end up receiving a phone call from an unknown caller. Uh, we don't know who that is for the simple fact that um, as the call was coming in, she was in the other room taking care of her son. So that's pretty much her story arc. Uh, the only other tidbit to add there was that she was playing the music box. And it was playing kind of the old timey music from the Great Depression. Um, which, when you're watching the episode, it kind of cuts away to what was happening to another character at the time. But I just think it was very interesting or fascinating, if you will, on what was happening here. Is that, you know, she's still kind of living her life, she's, she's still sticking to a routine. But she's also part of some kind of hidden thing going on. Uh, we don't know what that is or what that is associated with. All we know that it is is that it's happening. So that's the end of those kind of like the most minor characters, if you will. Even though uh, Philip Price is not a minor character, but he didn't have that much to do in the episode. Now we get to Angela. Now Angela is working, still working for Evil Corp. Uh, she's in the PR market, and she is negotiating the interview agreement for Philip Price. Now, she wants the, the agreement to go with Bloomberg. That's the place that they want to go to have the interview. But she's also talking to Fox News, even though Philip Price doesn't like Fox News and doesn't even like, uh, I guess you can say, Megyn Kelly. But she's just using it as a negotiating tactic to kind of get the better terms with Bloomberg or get the terms that, she, that uh, the company wants for the Philip Price interview. And when we open up to her scene, it was very interesting. It She's like in the foreground. And you hear like these two of her co-workers just be very snarky and talking about her. How she came out of the middle of nowhere. Nobody knows where she came from. They don't really like her. Uh, their boss, Melissa, doesn't like her. And they're just waiting for her to fail. They, they have no idea how she got there or even if she knows what she's doing. So Angela is basically having a very high stakes negotiations with the Bloomberg people about setting the terms and agreements for the interview. Uh, they want to talk about the Scott Knowles burning the $5.9 million. Uh, she's not having it. Philip Price is not going to answer any of those type of questions. And she basically ends up hanging up on Bloomberg as a kind of a negotiation tactic. Uh, the assistant um, is watching all this because he, 
because she tells her that, you know, Bloomberg's online. And she basically says that their boss, Melissa, is not going to like the fact that she hung up on Bloomberg. And basically, she's blowing it as far as trying to get this interview that she she probably should just let Melissa do it. Melissa knows how to set these interviews. And Angela just basically, without even looking, tells her to leave her cubicle to go. That she doesn't want her here. And this assistant is like, you know, maybe I should just go get Melissa. And she goes, why don't you do that? Why don't you go get Melissa? And so the assistant leaves. And it was kind of a very bomb-ass move. Because basically the assistant was being a backseat driver to what Angela was trying to do. And Angela was just trying to do her job. And this person is just being kind of petty about everything. It has really no meaning. So... Angela's sitting there. She's listening to her headphones, waiting for the phone call to come in. And the music is very interesting because there's a a bit of a dialogue or a theory that have been going online uh, since the season premiere about the music, which has always been very part of Mr. Robot. Uh, Last season was more like kind of electronica, synth music, very fitting with the the hacker culture, very fitting with technology, things that you could... uh, You would automatically associate it, even though synth music and drum bass and all that type of stuff um, has been around for a long time. They really became into the the genre or popularity with MP3 files. Well, this season has been more analog. This music that is very poppy, uh, stuff that you would typically find on the radio, which kind of fits within the whole loop and regimen of Elliot's thinking of keeping Mr. Robot at bay by just kind of downgrading and stepping back away from technology, away from basically the 21st century, if you will, the hum of it, which also kind of feeds into the background scenes that we've been seeing throughout the season premiere about just the little things that people are doing in the background. The um, When Susan Jacob was doing her run through the parks, how people were negotiating and selling their goods and wares on the streets. Uh, Bitcoin being an alternative means to get around the uh, credit cards and uh, debit cards that are being used. Uh, the small bills that are being used for cash only. The small businesses or businesses in general just uh, closing up shop. So all this kind of in the background where people are taking it back and are not necessarily um, using the same systems that they used before. Uh, The fact that um, something is revealed when uh, Angela is talking to the lawyer from her lawsuit, who she meets on later, that none of the smart, easy passes are working. Everything is just kind of slowly crumbling and failing, if you will. So here Angela is listening to this music that starts off in the kind of synth poppy type of thing of last season, and then it transits in, or synth, I wouldn't say poppy, but synth music. And then it transitions into a poppy type of a song. Uh, And then the phone call from Bloomberg comes and they agree to the terms, but they do want to talk about the suicide. Uh, Angela's like, you know, the suicide's not on the table. It's for the benefit of the family. It was on the air. It's public. Everybody knows about it. Philip Price doesn't really want to answer that question. The guy says that doesn't, that happened over a month ago. That's still kind of bullshit. We're going to ask the question. She's like, okay, but only one question. I got to prove of it. Please send the terms. And then that's when um, Melissa, her boss, comes with the assistant. And she basically tells her that they have the Bloomberg interview. They agree to all the terms. And that she's going to go get some coffee before the staff meeting. And just walks out like a boss. So obviously there's been a significant transformation of Angela. Uh, we see more of that as she meets up with, uh, later on in the evening, she meets up with the, the lawyer from the lawsuit. Uh, the lawyer talks about how it was very difficult for her to get back into the city, how uh, the tunnel's a mess, how she can't take the train because it's too hot, uh, it's like 90 degrees outside, that the smart easy passes aren't working, that everything's just, just a mess. And Angela's there to tell her in person that she's keeping her job and that she's not leaving Evil Corp. And the lawyer is like, you know, when we talked about it and discussed it about it, that the Colby offer that she didn't agree with her taking Colby's offer. But more importantly, she was like, you know, 
you really had no intention of leaving this job, did you? And Angela is like, you think they're, that they're evil? And she goes, yeah, they're bar 10,000 barbarians in suits. And Angela's like, well, they see value in me. They see that I'm an asset. They value that, and you don't even value that. I mean, in fact, I've been more of an asset to you than you have been to me. I'm the one who, you know, basically, in essence, brought this lawsuit to you and all of the material necessary to make the lawsuit go go forward. And the lawyer's just looking at Angela like she's crazy. And she's like, and Angela's like, I like my job. I like my life. I'm staying where I'm at. And the lawyer's just, you know, she knows Angela has set her mind, but she basically, <laughs> she does a pretty bitchy move. She, she takes Angela's drink and she drinks it. And then before she leaves, she, she tells her this kind of this kind of a joke, but also kind of party shot at Angela. And she's like, this, there's this couple, um, this woman at the bar, she gets approached by a man and he goes to up to her and they're talking and stuff. And he goes, would you sleep with me for a million dollars? And the woman pauses and thinks about it. And she thinks, you know, I've, you know, I've never had a million dollars before. Um, but before she could probably give her answer, the man says he decided that he's, he's changed his mind. He goes, and he goes, you know, I, you know, I've changed my mind. I really don't want to do this. And she goes, well, why? What it is? And he goes, well, what if I decided, you know, if, if I wanted to do this for a dollar? And she goes, what kind of woman do you think I am if, offer me a dollar he goes I already know what type of woman you are we're just negotiating here and then the lawyer just kind of leaves I'm probably probably telling the joke completely wrong but basically she just she thinks that Angela has basically just been kind of bought off if you will for for pennies really for pennies and she's just making a horrible mistake so the lawyer leaves, some other, some guy comes up to Angela, gives her some pickup line to the bar, and then he later revealed that the pickup line works, and Angela's uh, sleeping with him, and she's at her new apartment, and it's a very nice apartment. It's very modern, it's um, a, in a high-rise facility, there's very lots of windows, lots of very nice things. And Angela's sitting in the dark in her living room with her big screen TV. And she's listening to these um, positive affirmations um, from the television. Just, you know, whatever the person says, she says back. And she says with conviction and with a smile. And um, it kind of gives you an insight in this transformation that Angela has done to try to... She's kind of transformed herself, if you will, into this different person and obviously she no longer has the same money worries that she's had before um at the same time you know there was hints of this on her cubicle and stuff there was like a lot of positive affirmation um little signs up on her little cubicle wall there and so Angela is now a completely different person than the person that we met last season um Another interesting note is that it looks like she has QRT, which is, is Elliot's uh, fish. So that is the end of her storyline. I would like to see more of this, you know, develop more of this. Uh, Angela, if she is, um, is she really an inside person? Is she, did she go in there, like Kobe said, to get in the inside and do some good? Or has she been corrupted by Evil Corp? So let's get back to Elliot. Um, so Elliot is um, at the recreational court. Um, he's there with his friend Leon that he meets with um, at dinner. And they're watching the basketball game. And as the basketball game goes, the ball gets kind of tossed out of the court towards Leon. And the guys in the court are yelling at Leon to pick up the ball. And Leon's not picking it up. He's being very non-responsive. Um, they keep yelling at him, and then finally Leon picks up the ball, and he tosses it away. And then one of the guys from the court is like, why are you being an asshole? Uh, gets in his face, and it looks like a fight's about to break out. 
but this guy Ray, um, which we talked a little bit about last last episode, but this is where the introduction of this character happens. Uh, he comes in with the the dog, and he says, "Hey, hey, I have the ball." He gives it to the guy that's on the basketball court, and he basically kind of calmly, with the his you know sincerity of his voice, if you will, breaks up the fight. Um, he befriends Elliot. He goes, you know, you must be a dog person because my dog really likes you. You know, he says, he talks a little bit about how he has a business and stuff like that. He's trying to have a, you know, kind of a conversation with Elliot and Elliot's not having it. Um, he kind of knows that Elliot does computers. Uh, Mr. Robot's in the background and Mr. Robot says to help him, but that Elliot doesn't want to help him. And then robot, Mr. Robot you know, bit of an exaggerated state. He says he doesn't want to be in his, like, analog nightmare any longer. Uh, Ray is, like, says that Elliot's kind of being cold to him, kind of being cold, and then Elliot just kind of leaves, uh, leaves the, the place, if you will, and goes back to his room, Go back, goes back to his, you know, his routine, if you will. And when we cut back to Elliot again, he, you know, he's has a bandage on his head you know he's he's back at the court again um he doesn't want you know he doesn't want anything to do with um ray he doesn't want anything to do with mr robot he doesn't want anything he just wants to get back to a kind of sense of purpose if you will where it's just him and nobody else uh you know, Ray tries again to talk with Elliot. Elliot uh, spoke with him and he doesn't remember. Ray's not quite disturbed by the fact that Elliot doesn't remember him speaking to him. But Elliot was like, no, I, I didn't speak with you. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know about whatever this conversation is. And he starts panicking. So he, he jets from the recreational center and he goes back to his room and he checks his journal. And he sees there's a missing gap. There's a gap between uh, 10.30 and 6.30 a.m. And he knows that something happened. And somehow Mr. Robot took over. And Mr. Robot is basically, you know, yelling at him. He's like, what? You don't understand what people see when they see you, Elliot, is they see me. And he wants Elliot to realize, realize that people see Mr. Robot, the persona, and not Elliot. And he's holding a gun onto Elliot's head and basically telling him to get back on the gravy train, to get back on the train and get back to the revolution. And Elliot laughs like a maniac. And um, Mr. Robot doesn't get it. And Elliot tells him, you go ahead, shoot me. Keep shooting me. But I'm not going to help you until you tell me what, what I need to know. And basically that question is, is what happened to Ty, Ty Well Wellick? And... Mr. Robot doesn't tell him, and he goes, fine, and he basically walks out of the room. Um, Mr. Elliot, uh, or I should say Elliot, uh, Mr. Robot is perplexed, if you will, confused. He doesn't understand how Elliot is having such a strong control over the situation, if you will. So we cut further along, and Elliot, um, he's fallen asleep during his church group and it's during the reading of the book of revelations about alpha omega that portion of the book I, I don't really know my bible that very well and he's fallen asleep and then elliot wakes up and when he wakes up it's because he hears a ringing of a phone in his ear and it's a big bright red phone if you will and it the phone ring sounds like either it's a like an international call the way that it's ringing, the kind of the, the tone of it, or it's like a ship to ship type of call. It's it's, a, it's not your traditional type of phone ring. And someone picks up and it's Ty, Tywell Wellick. And Elliot says hello. And then Tywell Wellick speaks and he goes, this is really you. Am I speaking to you? And Elliot's like, who's this? And then Tywell Alex says, Bonjour, Elliot. And that is the end of Elliot's storyline. Um, 
I guess we can get into this before we talk about Gideon. Um, there's more kind of hints and revelations that possibly, and I don't know really how I feel about this, about whether or not it, the prison theory that's been going online that Elliot is really in prison. Um, I'm not sure if it's prison or a, a drug hab facility, but he is, he's projecting a type of image that is different from the place that he exists. I mean, even the buildings kind of look all the kind of like the same and kind of static presence. He's going to the same places over and over again. Again, this could be about his loop. Um, Ray could be either a counselor or a security guard, or if he's in a prison, a prison guard. Um, I talk about this on Twitter with Hello Friend. I, I like that the prison theory is very intriguing, but um, San Diego Comic Con was over the week. And it seems that Samuel Esmail has said that, you know, Sam Esmail has said that he's not into the gotcha type of moments. And it kind of feels like the prison theory might be kind of a gotcha type of moment. Um, either way, it's, it's interesting, even if it turns out that it's the case that um, Elliot has been projecting this type of uh, an illusion, if you will, or delusion. To help him cope with the fact of where he is. Um, it just shows kind of the more the disintegrating mind of Elliot. And I don't know if I'm ready to accept that the, that the character has disintegrated that far gone into his mental illness. That basically it means that he has no grasp of reality whatsoever. And that really he should not be leading any type of revolution. But really seeking some help. But... We'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see whether or not that, that theory actually pans out. Again, this episode gives more hints of that with the fact that, again, you know, same place, recreational facility, Ray as a kind of a guard, uh, the sameness, the blandness of the, the place that Elliot is at. It will it'll be interesting to see if that, that pans out. Um, I guess we can now get into the Gideon stuff. Um... So Gideon, uh, quick cut to Gideon, this is towards the end of the episode, he's at the bar, he's approached by a man who calls himself Brock, uh, again on the, uh, uh, the television news, and is talking about the burning of the $5.9 million, and that it's by a more militant wing of F Society, kind of giving F Society kind of like the uh, anonymous kind of a kind of a deal where anonymous is not one single collective group of people but a series of different groups all doing different types of things uh it's interesting to see that f society may have morphed into that more of a deal here in the uh, mr robot universe but basically you know gideon's at this bar this guy brock approaches him starts kind of rambling and talking but when i say rambling he's very calm about his rambles uh, he talks about Black Tuesday, he talks about how F Society knows what they're doing, that they're being very smart uh, with the burning of the money. He talks about other hacks that happened before the Evil Corp hack, about the Army Corps engineers, the personal management, uh, the FBI, etc. All these different government agencies that were hacked prior to the F Society hacked about two years prior, in fact. Um, Gideon cuts the man off, saying he, he doesn't really want to talk about any of that. Um, and Brock was like, well, what do you want to talk about? Do you want to talk about Barbados? Uh, you want to talk about, you know, he starts flirting with Gideon, basically. And Gideon, you know, holds up a hand, his hand and says that, you know, he's married. And this is when Brock reveals his name, saying his name is Brock. Um, and then basically he goes, you know, I know who you are. You know, I'm a bit of a news junkie. You're Gideon, Gideon. And Gideon's like, you know, I, I, I'm just here to drink. I don't want to be bothered. And he goes, you know, yeah, but, you know, your husband left you. And he goes, well, how is that in the news? He goes, no, it's on your face. And he goes, you have a very sympathetic face. Uh, that's why you, you can be used as a patsy, a vessel for their lives. And, you know, uh, Gideon go, agrees with him. And he goes, yeah, it's, it seems like there's, uh, you know, something grander or greater go on, going on that I have no control of. And the guy smiles at him and goes, thank you. You know, 
tomorrow, you know, um, I'm going to be a hero. You know, he says also something very key. He says, you're like the best crisis actor I've ever seen. All this language should have been warning lights for Gideon, or at least to me, about, you know, a sympathetic face and a patsy and a vessel for their lives. That's when I personally would have started got, gotten up, and especially when the guy started saying crisis actor. That's when I would have got out the door, got security or something, because that to me is a very indication of a strong, crazy person. But Gideon was just, you know, he's depressed. He just lost his business. His marriage is broken up. He's being hounded by the FBI. And the guy pulls out a gun, was able to take, you know, take uh, Gideon at a vulnerable moment and shoots him in the neck. And I'm pretty sure he kills him. Uh, that Gideon is basically, you know, dead. And this is the first that you can say significant casualty in the war that F Society that Elliot started between him and Evil Corp. The unintended consequences beyond just the the slow unraveling of civilization that is happening in the in the foreground of the series. You know, Gideon's dead, and this is all in essence Elliot's fault. And that pretty much wraps up the episode. I mean, the episode actually ends with uh, Elliot getting that phone call from Ty, Ty Wellick. But again, you know, this show kind of plays upon um, real things that are happening. Talks about, you know, this is something that crisis actors have talked about. If you look into the whole Sandy Hook thing, um, which is where that term kind of came into prominence. Um, this is something that's very real and happening. Uh, F Society becoming more of like anonymous where there's all these different kind of separatist groups that are working and doing different things. Um, Joanne Wellick and the, the use of a kind of hidden phone type of a deal going on. Uh, Angela and her positive affirmations. There's a lot of transformations that are happening, ju not just with Elliot, but with a lot of people uh, within this, uh, this world. So it'll be interesting to see how we carry on forward. Um, it set a very, kind of this very bleak tone to Mr. Robot for this season. Um, it's not positive. It's not rah, 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 where our heroes have really prevailed. It's very, everyone's very much in the muck, if you will. And I, I'm really enjoying it and liking it. So I'm logging off for now. Uh, thank you for chatting with me, and I will see you next time. Thank you for joining us on this chat. You can find us on all podcast outlets such as iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, MixCloud, and any podcast catcher. You can reach us on Twitter at FSocietyIRC, our website at FSocietyIRC.xyz. You can email us at FSocietyIRC at ProtonMail.com. Our music attributes are under the Creative Commons license number three. The intro music is by Monk. The song is called The Planet Shakers, the Paragraph Remix. Our outro music is by Trevet Halbeka, and the song is El Picaba, as well as Quana, and the song is Demons. You can support the show either via the QR code in the show notes by contributing with a Bitcoin or through PayPal, and there's a link in the show notes where you can PayPal me under Hiroja Shai. If you're very into uh, cryptocurrency, you can also tip me through a uh, chain chip at Hiroja or at one name at Hiroja. Thank you very much for listening and look forward to hearing from you. Logging off. This has been a Hiroja Shad Space Odyssey Network production.